Hey, RCC, it's great to be with you this morning. And I want you right now to take that piece of paper that you have and go ahead and take your pen. I want you to write your name at the very top of it. So write your name at the very top of the page. And uh, I want to tell you something about the name of the person you're writing right now. That person lives every day with hopes and dreams and expectations in life, professionally, spiritually, relationally, physically. I mean, you've got expectations that those, that those plans will be a reality, right? I mean, every one of us does. Something else I know about the person's name you just wrote down, this person has things they love to do. So I want you to put in the second, second thing I want you to write is what you love to do. What is it? What is it that you're talented at? You got a skill, you got a hobby. I mean, if it was me, I'm writing golf. I've got so many memories of being on a golf course with uh, my grandfather, with my own kids. My wife loves it when I take the kids out golfing because it gives her a break. Um, also, I love kayaking. You can see on the screen a, a photo of, of, of something I love to do. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about flat water. I, I really don't do flat water unless my wife makes me. I love being on water that makes my mom and my wife very worried. I grew up white water kayaking and it's just something I, I love to do. That's when I feel like I'm at home. The third line, I want you to write a dream that has been unfulfilled. All right. So the third thing I want you to do on your piece of paper is write a dream that's unfulfilled. It's something you hope to do one day but you haven't done it yet. Maybe it's mountain climbing. Maybe it's uh, writing a book or adopting a child. Sometimes it might be something really simple, like I just, I just want to be happy. Or I just want the scales of my life to kind of tilt in a positive direction in my way. You know, I'd love for that to happen. Or for those of us who want to lose weight, maybe it's, you know what, I want to go to bed and then wake up skinny. I mean, that'd be fabulous. Or, hey, I want good things to happen. Good people to good people because if, if I was God, that's how things would go. Good things would happen to good people. Right? Good, good mothers would always be healthy. Uh, good kids would, would never get leukemia. Faithful spouses would always have great marriages. You know, good fathers would never have heart attacks. Hard workers would always be well paid. Uh, wonderful married couples would be able to always have kids and have children if they wanted them. Or, or, you know, just be honest, you know, the, a, a world that's just functioning okay wouldn't have viruses. I mean, those are the kind of dreams that many of us carry. But something else I know about the person whose name you wrote at the top of your, of your paper is that one time or another, here it is, you have been disappointed. I mean, life has not always lived up to your expectations. I mean, it's, it's especially frustrating when life was, has been going great. I mean, you've been on a winning streak, and then one day it just seems like it just stops. I mean, I mean, just a six weeks ago, it seems like things were just fine. And all of a sudden, look at us now. And we have, uh, we have this pond behind our house, and I like going back there, and, and River and I will fish, and sometimes we go back there, and we're just throwing the pole, the, the bait in the water, and brim are just hopping. In fact, you can see on the screen right now a, a photo of River. This actually happened just a few days ago. He caught this, he caught something. We don't know what it was. I think it was a catfish, and it was on, it was on, his, on his line, and I mean, it was on there for at least a good half minute, and he's about to reel it in, and all of a sudden, it just, it got off. Off. And it's just kind of extremely disappointing. And many of us get disappointed right now. We're disappointed because, you know what, we were supposed to graduate. We don't have a graduation ceremony. Some of us are disappointed because we had plans, we were going to do this, but now we're having to work and teach our kids at home right now. Uh, some of us are expecting to teach kids and we're not teaching. And, or maybe some of us are upset because we can't finish our sports season out. How about this, not being able to see people. Not be able to see our grandkids. Uh, maybe you had a vacation plan. Rachel and I had a vacation of our wildest dreams plan. That had to be canceled. Maybe a wedding is canceled or being postponed. Or a family reunion is having to be uh, shelled for this time. And that's how I feel when I look back at some of the most disappointing times of my life. I think about my best friend Scott's death. I mean, it was just so disappointing to me. He had four children, a wonderful wife. He was serving the Lord in Minnesota. He was helping the churches stay strong in Minnesota. And then on a trip to Reno, getting cancer treatment, he ended up passing away. 
And, and it was a tough time for many of us. He was 33 years old. And I, I, the disappointment, I, I'll be honest with you, I felt with God. I was just like, God, how can you allow this to happen? I mean, Scott is a mighty servant in your kingdom. And he's not sitting on the sidelines like a lot of guys are doing. He's in the throes of helping people and spreading the gospel. And he's loyal to his family. And, you know, drunk people walk away from wrecks every single day. And you let my best friend with four kids die of cancer? It's like, really? I mean, it didn't seem fair to me. It didn't seem right. Now, and now if, I had, if I had a more immature perspective, rather than saying, Lord, how did you allow this to happen? I might have said, I might have said this. I said, why did you take my best friend? You know, you know, like God just decides to take fathers away from little boys and little girls. And I'm pretty sure I, I know something else about the persons whose name is on your paper. Whether they're a follower of Jesus or not, sooner or later, you're going to have, face disappointment. You're going to face disappointment with God. I mean, you're going to walk in one morning and your supervisor is going to call you in and is going to inform you that your position is being eliminated. Or that a child you had hopes and dreams for runs away and gets addicted to something and goes to jail. And I know we've all been disappointed by something or we will be because disappointment has a way of raising up some troubling questions, even with God. Questions like this, is God really there? If he's there, why didn't he do something? And this sense of disappointment makes it hard for some of us to believe in God. And one thing I love about the Bible is that it addresses those deep disappointments. And then rather than these simplistic answers, you know, the Bible usually gives us what I call, it gives us a path to take as we think and trust our way through disappointments. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up right now to Psalms 77. Psalms 77. The Psalms teach us about being real with God. They, they, these are prayers, and you'll notice that these prayers, they are, they are very raw. They're pretty raw. The value of having these raw conversations with God is that it gets what's in the inside of you, and it puts it out on the table. And this is what's amazing about ministries like Celebrate Recovery, Grief Share that we have here at RCC. You get, you get a chance to talk honestly about what's on the inside. You get to talk honestly about the disappointments in your life. And the great thing about doing that is that once you start talking about it, it's not very long until you start dealing with it. I've had someone tell me about being abused as a child. and They kept it inside for decades. They kept it a secret for decades. And it messed up their relationship with God. But then they started talking about it out loud with trusted friends. And that healing began to happen. And this is what we see in the Psalms. Now the Psalms can be really confusing because the content can change from page to page. But then again, let's just be honest. Life is like that, isn't it? Life can change real quick. And as you're reading through the Psalms, you want to remember they are different kind of psalms. And one of the psalms we're going to look at today is songs of lament. And that, that word lament comes from Latin. It's a Latin word which means weeping. And you can tell when you're reading like a psalm of lament because it sounds like you got somebody who's just kicking and banging on a locked door. I mean, it's really intense. So here's a question I want to ask you. How do you talk to God when something has so completely broken your heart that you don't know if you'll ever recover? How do you talk to God? How do you talk to him when you have a broken heart? And I think the answer is this, is honestly, respectfully and honestly. And family, the Psalms of Lament show us how to do that. They teach us how we can love God and also feel disappointment towards God all at the same time. And so if you look with me at Psalm 77, it was written by a person just like you. His name is Asaph, and he is a, he's in a season of extreme disappointment. Just like some of us right now, extreme disappointment. And it says, it says to him that God 
is unresponsive. It seems like that's what's going on to him. And so if you look at verse 1, let's see if you've ever felt this way like Asaph does in verse 1. Here's what it says. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. Verse 2. When, when I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. God, I remembered you, God, and I, look at this, I groaned and I meditated and my spirit grew faint. Now, we don't know what Asaph is disappointed with. Maybe it was triggered by a loss of life, a suffering from a disease, or a, a betrayal of a friend, a financial loss. We don't know. We just know that he's crushed by disappointment and his soul is weary because of it. Verse 4 says this, you kept my eyes from closing. It was too troubled. I was too troubled to speak. He can't sleep. He's blaming God for it. Maybe you're like me, you're having sometimes a trouble sleeping right now. I mean, he's so disappointed. Let's be honest, he can't even talk. I've, I've had that happen in my life. I can't even talk about it. And here's the first thing we need to learn about Asaph. When you're disappointed, be realistic about prayer. Be realistic. Now, 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 maybe you know someone who's going through a huge disappointment in life. If you do, what's one of the first things Christians tell someone to do when they're going through a difficult time? Right? What's one of the first things we do? Sometimes we say, hey, just pray about it. That's what we say. Just pray about it. And can I just tell you, when you tell someone just pray about it, it's not really the most biblical response to give someone when they are disappointed. I mean, they should pray. But not just pray, because Asaph was not a spiritual rookie. Prayer, if you notice in verse 1, was the very first step that he took. I mean, he's been praying, but he is drowning in disappointment. Now, prayer doesn't seem to be working for him. And if you've been a follower of Jesus very long, you've been through a hard time. You know exactly how Asaph feels. Family, in Psalm 77, it cautions us about giving glib, superficial advice to each other in the times of great disappointment. I remember when I moved to Phoenix, um, uh, a woman came and asked me if I knew any Christian counselors. And I had just moved there, and I didn't really know any Christian counselors. And I just kind of said, you know, I'll, I'd be glad to help if I can. And she looked me right in the eyes, and she said, the last thing I need right now is for someone to tell me to just pray about this. I was like, whoa. <laughs> kind of shot back. I mean, she was aggressive. I said, well, I, I'm assuming you're praying about this, but I, I, I would encourage you to look at your options and then make a plan with steps that need to be taken for the solution of whatever it is you're, you're facing right now, and then, then pray about those steps as you take them. But apparently, she had been told just to pray about it a few too many times. Now, when you are facing deep disappointment, prayer is, is the first thing you should do. But it's certainly not the only thing you should do. And so Asaph is praying, but he thinks God isn't doing anything. And that leads him to some haunting questions about who God is. Like, what is God capable of? Or what is God willing to do or not willing to do in my life? Now, here's what I want you to think about as we work through this this morning. Think of this line right here uh, as, a, as a line of prayer. It's a prayer line. We start here in our prayer life, and we have a grief, we have a disappointment, and then we work all our way over here to the answer and to peace. Now, now through this timeline, you have the answer, right? You get to the answer, you get to peace, but over here, you don't have the answers, so let me tell you, this season right here can take a long time. A friend of mine was an atheist, and, and, uh, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. But you want to know how long his wife prayed for him? It wasn't months. It wasn't years. It was decades. And so if I were to ask her, you think she's happy she didn't quit? What do you think she'd say? Of course she's happy she didn't quit. She's happy she didn't quit at month one or year one or year five. Now Asaph is writing the psalm and he's right here. He's at the beginning somewhere. Just remember that. Remember that he's right, he's, he's, he's there as we start in verse seven which says this. Will the Lord reject forever? 
Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Is God a promise breaker? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Like basically saying, is God angry with me? And man, these are real concerns. If you have been disappointed with God, you probably ask similar questions, right? So if this sounds like something you said, I want you to know something. You're not the first. You're not the first. C.S. Lewis, a powerful, powerful author, amazing Christian philosopher. He was single for most of his life, but at age 58, he got married to a woman named Joy. And they had an amazing marriage, amazing, amazing time until four years in their marriage. And she contracted cancer and she died in the fourth year of marriage. And he wrote about processing grief after her death. And this is what he wrote. I'm going to read to you these words that C.S. Lewis wrote about, his, about losing his wife. Uh, it says this. Meanwhile, where's God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you're tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to God when, you, when your need is desperate, when all your other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face. A sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. And after that, silence. You may as well turn away. Because the longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. Now, if you could tell the phrase uh, from the fra- uh, phrase from the phrase, you would see this. He's right here, isn't he? This is where C.S. Lewis is writing from. Now, over the over this time when his prayer is actually answered in this section, you talk to him three, five years later, what's he going to say? He's going to say, yeah, God comforted me. Uh, God never forsook me. God loved me during the whole process, right? Where, but where's he writing this from? He's writing this from the very beginning of this journey, right? From the very beginning where the answer has not shown up yet. The blessing of comfort over here has not come. And those words from C.S. Lewis are a man who are struggling with grief. Now as years later, you know God comes through and answers his disappointments and our disappointments. But it doesn't seem like that in the season of grieving. And the longer I've been in ministry, I've gotten more comfortable saying these three words. And you know what these, those three words are? I don't know. I, I don't know why some people pray for a job and stay unemployed. I don't know why innocent African children get AIDS from their mother's milk. I, I don't know why a, a little girl right now at Orange Park Medical Center gets leukemia. I don't know why sons and daughters get abused in homes where they should be protected. I, I, I don't know why kids that need to be adopted can't get connected with godly people who want to adopt children. Now the Bible gives us reasons for this. The Bible says we live in a world that's been broken by sin. And one day God is going to make it right. But that hasn't happened yet, right? I mean, the Bible says that God has given us a gift of free will. And we can use that for good, or we also suffer when we use it for bad. And that's what's going on right now with the coronavirus. And we look at the start of this, it's not God, it's man's bad decisions. And there, ha- there, there are a lot of theological explanations on why there's pain in our world. And if you know that, it'll help you as you grieve deeply in disappointing times rather than getting angry and disappointed with God. But I still can't answer why God answers certain prayers so quickly And others seem to be this long periods of silence. I can't explain it. You know, there's a word that's used in the Bible to describe the season when God seems to be silent. And that word is mystery, right? We don't like that word, but that's the word, mystery. It, it, may, it, may, it may be clear in the future, right? In the future, oh, I know what God was doing now. <clears throat> and when, when, you, when you look back, though, when you're in this phase, I mean, it's a mystery. 
Now, there's a fourth thing I, I want you to write down right now on your piece of paper. I want you to write down the mystery of your life that you can understand. The thing that's most disappointed you in your life, I want you to write that down. The thing that you cannot understand, if you have the courage, go ahead and write that on your piece of paper. What's the one thing you feel most disappointed by? So what, what, what do we learn from the psalmist about how to deal with those mysteries that you're writing down? That, that, that disappointment that you're writing down right now. What, what, what do we learn? Well, Asaph actually gives us some intel on what else we can do during these dark times. And he says, actually in verse 11 and 12, look what he says. I will what? I'll remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will what? I'll remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Now, what in the world is Asaph going to do here? What's he doing? He's not just praying. He's going to start meditating. He's going to start refocusing his mind on who God is. And that's the next step. When you're disappointed, refocus on God's character when you're disappointed. And as you pray, you want to make sure you have a very clear picture of who God is. So before we meditate on the character of God, you know where our prayers often centered at before we meditate on God? Most of the time, our prayer is centered on who? Me. It's all about me, right? I'm in trouble. <clears throat> I'm in need. I'm depressed. I'm in pain. I'm disappointed. I'm lonely. Now listen. This could lead you to start thinking this. Well, God did this to me, right? And, and if, you're, if you felt that way, you need to talk to a really mature believer and ask, hey, why did God give me cancer? Right? And that mature believer will help you refocus your, on the character of God. And they'll say, whoa, hold on now. God didn't give you cancer. God made this world perfect. The misuse of free will brought sin into the world. And sin is why we have cancer. God doesn't give people cancer. Now listen, if you misunderstand the character of God, I mean, you'll blame him for stuff that's not even part of his character. Right, and that happens all the time. God gets blamed for stuff all the time that's not part of him. That's what, that's what Asaph is doing. He says, I cried out to God, but he doesn't care about me. He convinces himself of stuff that isn't even true or real. Look at verse 9. I mean, has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in, in anger withheld his compassion? I guess God is ticked off with me. I guess he's forgotten about me. I, I love Asaph's honesty. But he's going to change his tune here in just a moment. Look at that scripture again. It says selah. That, that's the last word. It's a musical term meaning a key change. There's a, there's a change in the tone of the music. It reflects a change in the thinking of the writer. That's what that selah means. In verse 10, Asaph, Asaph starts gaining clarity on God's character. And he does that by replaying God's track record. Instead of focusing on his pain and his disappointment and his depression, look what happens in verse 11. He says, I will, what church? I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will, what church? I will remember your miracles of long ago. Asaph focuses his thinking on times in Israel's past when it seemed like, you know what? God wasn't really doing anything, right? That's what it seemed like. But guess what? He was doing something. Look at verse 16. He recalls the time in your Bibles. He recalls the time when the Israelites were in the Red Sea. Remember that time? They're in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is in front of them. The Egyptians are behind them. And it looks like that they are got nowhere to go. That they're trapped. But what are they saying? You remember what they're saying at that time? They start going, where's God? Where's God? Has he brought us out here to die? And then God does a miracle and he parts the Red Sea. Listen, God had a plan all along. When he was with the Israelites, God had a plan all along. It just wasn't a plan that they ever thought about or that they ever would have chosen. But listen, he wasn't silent. It just seemed to be silent during that time. He was at work though the whole time. 
What happened at the Red Sea? Saved the Israelites. But guess what? It encouraged Asaph a thousand years later. And it encourages us here at RCC thousands of years later. And I don't know what you put down on your fourth line. But I do know you need to focus less on that disappointment and more on God who is greater, stronger, bigger than any disappointment. The Red Sea reminds Asaph about something that he had forgotten about God. Here it is. God's compassion. God's compassion. It's even clearer, I think, about an event that happened in Joshua chapter 3. Israelites have spent 40 years because of their rebellion and disobedience wandering around in the desert. But finally, after 40 years, this big moment is here, and they're going into the promised land. Unfortunately, they're facing another water challenge. It seems like there's always a water challenge when it comes to Israelites. And the Jordan River, of all times, is that flood stage. Bad time to be crossing. And they've got millions and millions of people. So what are they going to do? Well, Joshua prayed And then God gives him guidance. So he prays, God gives him guidance, and then Joshua obeys, and then the miracle happens. After the obedience, the miracle happens. He has these priests, of all things, line up and just march right into the river. And man, when they start marching towards the river, I mean, it's flooding. I mean, that river is roaring. It looks like a disaster. I mean, you've got people with three-year-olds going, man, my three-year-old can't swim. Man, my kids are going to die. We're going to die. And the moment the priest's feet touch the river, remember, the water stops. And the river went completely dry. And everyone, all millions of people, crossed. And it was weird. It was scary. It was unnatural. And here's what Joshua 3 says. Look at your Bibles. Look on the screen. Here's what it says. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest, yet... As soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream, notice that, the water from upstream stopped what? Flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. And so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Now notice that the author said that the river stopped flowing upstream in a place called Adam. Now scholars say that Adam was 19 miles upstream from where the Israelites were. I mean, it was a miracle. But it was a miracle they could not see at first. They saw the river stop, but they didn't see how the river stopped. They didn't see the actual miracle. They all benefited from the miracle that God performed upstream out of sight. And here's what I want you to consider about the character of God. When you are disappointed, number three, remember that God is working upstream even when you can't see what he's doing. So where is God when when it seems silent? When it seems silent right here in your life and you can't see him and you're facing maybe the worst disappointment in your life. Well, guess what? He's upstream. He's out of sight working for your good. The Israelites couldn't, could only see the problem, right? Right in front of them. They could only see this raging, flood river. This tunnel vision led them to think, hey, God's absent. He's not here. He doesn't care. But they were wrong. Just because they couldn't see him at work doesn't mean he wasn't at work upstream. And family, I'm telling you right now, God is working upstream in your life right now as well. Asaph teaches us this, that something about disappointment I love. Number four, resist the temptation to stop learning when you are disappointed. I tell you, right now is a great time to sit and go into God's Word and just allow Him to speak to you during this time. Let's not waste it. So here's the question. I have this for you. Though God is working upstream in your life, why does He allow His children to go through such tough times? Why doesn't he just send like a quick solution? Why doesn't he just spare us of all this pain and just go ahead and, you know, get us to the answer? Well, James, the brother of Jesus, gives us the answer. And here's what he says. Consider it pure what, church? Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face what? Trials. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, like what? I beg your pardon? 
I'm supposed to be joyful about going through these trials? Really? Why? Because you know, here's the answer. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops what, church? It develops perseverance. So question, when have you grown the most spiritually in your life? When have you grown the most spiritually in life? Have you grown more in the good times or have you grown more in the bad times? I mean, when have you learned most in your life? Is it in the good times or in the bad times? What's the answer? So if you're in a bad time, guess what? There's one thing you can be glad about. It's that you'll be growing. You're going to be learning. And so my hardship has a deliverable. It shows the glory of God. And so if there is anything I can be thankful for when I'm going through a hard time, it's this, I'll be stronger when this is all over. I'll be wiser when this is all over. I love what James says next in James 1, 4. He says, perseverance must finish its work so that you, church, may be what? You may be mature and you may be what? You may be complete, not lacking anything. See, this disappointment isn't random. Now, I want you to know it's not caused by God. It's caused by sin. But God can use it for a good, great purpose. He does that all the time. So, so now let's ask, why would God deliberately allow Asaph to go through a season of doubt, a season of disappointment? And here's the answer. There are some things we only learn when we're disappointed. Let's be honest. We only learn those times, only learn about what God wants for us when we're disappointed. Disappointment. Disappointment is one of the greatest grad schools you will ever go through. Disappointment is where you earn your MSM, Masters in Spiritual Maturity. I mean, if God is going to grow you in a new, as a new believer, you know, from a new believer to a strong, mature, wise child of God, you have to pass tests in the graduate school of disappointment. And I want you to know something right now, church. You will. You will. Verse 13, by the time he gets to verse 13, he says this. Your ways, God, your ways are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. And he's thinking, you do amazing things among your people, even in season of disappointment. And he's thinking, I'm one of those people. And I want you to know something right now, RCC, you also are one of those people. God is at work in your life, and we want to walk through uh, this season with you any way we can. If there's a way we could be there for you, go ahead and go to the virtual connect card at riverchristian.church slash online. And if there's something we could pray about, leave it there. We'd be honored to pray for you. We got our elders, we got staff, we have uh, a prayer team that will be praying for you. Maybe right now you go, you know what? I need God's help in this season. I've never said I needed God's help, but I want to join on and be part of something amazing. Because we get through this, we're going to be stronger. We're going to be wiser. It's going to be phenomenal. But you have to be a part of God's team, and you're not. So you said, you know what? I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord. But now it's time for you also to accept him in baptism. And so if you want to do that, go ahead and click on the button there at riverchristian.church slash online, the virtual connect card, and you can do that. Many people started doing that last week, and I'm telling you, you can join them in accepting Jesus Christ. But right now, RCC, I'm going to pray over you, so will you join me in prayer? Father God, we come before you, and Lord, um, we can't always see the sun. We still believe in it. We can't always see you, but we still believe in you. And I'm thankful for the honesty that Asaph shows in this psalm to inspire us to pray honest prayers. And I want to thank you for the people who've come alongside myself to remind me that you were always at work, even when I couldn't see you. And Lord, I thank you so much for people at RCC who do that for others right now. And Father, I'm thankful for the healing that can come even in times of hurting and in times of great disappointment. Lord, I'm thankful that there are those of us online that are in peace right now, even through this walk, through even this season of disappointment. It's because your peace helps us surpass all understanding. And so, Lord, we want to continue to walk with you and walk with one another. 
Lord, thank you so much for being with us through seasons of disappointment until we get to a place of the answer that provides peace. Lord, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. May we lean into him during the season as a church. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. And the whole church said, amen. RCC, we love you so much. And let's continue to worship our amazing God. If there's any way we can be blessing to you, go ahead and leave a comment in the Facebook group or the YouTube page right now. Or once again, you can sign that virtual connect card on our website. But RCC, right now, let's worship our amazing God together.